Hey Amen. Well, good morning to you. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to grab them and turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Uh, we're going to start in verse 32 uh, this week, which is the same verse that we started in last week. We only covered a couple of verses, but we'll be reading through, uh, actually through the first 11 verses of chapter 5, where we'll spend our time uh, this morning. For those of you who may not know me or may be new to FAC, my name is Mike Kazrowski. I'm the lead pastor here. It is a joy and a privilege to share in the morning uh, with you, and I would love the opportunity to, to meet you if we haven't had the chance yet. I'm usually up front after service, and would love for you to, to come up and just say hello and uh, share a little bit about your story. Uh, I do want to illuminate a need that we have here at FAC before we begin. Um, if you're familiar with some of our programs, you'll know that our MOPS group is one of the more healthy ministries in the church. And we, uh, th this is a ministry for moms of uh, young children, uh, young families. And I myself uh, have a young family, and so I can speak to the um, just to the wonderful ministry that MOPS is. And we currently have a waiting list for moms to join the last eight uh, meetings of this group the rest of the year. It pains me that we are literally rejecting moms, uh, a portion of those who aren't from FAC that could be ministered to. Uh, and the reason we have a waiting list is because we don't have enough child care help uh, and volunteers. Uh, and speaking with uh, Jeanette Paradis, who's the staff point person for this, and in communication with Jen Mackison, the MOPS coordinator, all we need is four more people who would be willing to serve on a couple of Thursday mornings in a month, and we would be able to meet the needs of all of those moms on the waiting list. And so uh, let me ask you to prayerfully consider if you're available on Thursday mornings. It's not every week, it's every other week, uh, I believe. Um, consider that as... Uh, the, the end of the year comes down and consider the impact and the ministry that you could have on some moms that are eagerly awaiting an opportunity to be a part of this community. Uh, should you decide that this is something that you could do, uh, you can contact our MOPS coordinator, Jen Mackison, directly. Her contact information is in the bulletin. Uh, I would strongly urge four people to step up so we can meet the needs of several moms that are on that waiting list. Um, let's go ahead and turn to God's word this morning, starting in verse 32 of chapter 4. It says this, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and the great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were uh, owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet." But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard of these things. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we... Ask now, Lord, that you would bring clarity of thought. Uh, and we ask that you would bring conviction, Father, where we need to be convicted, Lord. I pray, Father, 
that um, as we view uh, and evaluate how we view even our own possessions, Father, that you would bless our time this morning and that your spirit would move about our minds, engage with our minds so that we may have a, uh, he has a pathway to our heart and that there would be transformation. And in your holy name I pray, amen. Once there was an affluent Jewish official who approached Jesus and had one simple question. He had heard about Jesus, the teaching about eternal life, and it piqued his curiosity. You see, this Jewish man had acquired a great deal of wealth, and so when he heard Jesus preaching about the riches that were to be found in eternity, he wanted to ensure that when the time came, he was able to reap the benefit. And so he approached Jesus and he asked him one, this one simple question. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I think from his perspective, he had realized that he had done a great deal to uh, gain wealth in this world and he wanted to ensure that he could gain great wealth in the next Well, Jesus actually immediately challenges him on the subjective nature of calling somebody good. He says, you refer to me as good teacher. Who, how can you call anybody good? Only God is good. And he goes on to explain that because only God is truly good and his goodness is defined by the law. And so he asks the man several uh, questions about the 10 commandments. He rattles off several of them. And the rich young ruler, perhaps hopeful, but not satisfied with Jesus' response, says, you know, I've done all those things. In fact, I've kept them from the time I was a little boy, but there's still something else missing. What else do I lack? And Jesus agrees with him. He says, "You, you do still lack one thing. Go and sell all of your possessions. And once you've done that, give the proceeds to the poor. And then when you've done that, come back and follow me. The man left disheartened and feeling sorrowful as he was not willing to give up all that he had accumulated for the sake of following Jesus. And once he left, Jesus turns to his disciples and he explains how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. Now, it's important to note uh, about that story that's recorded in three of the four Gospels, that this man's salvation was not contingent on him selling all that he had and giving to the poor. His salvation was actually contingent on whether or not he was going to follow Jesus. It's not as though in order to inherit eternal life, we need to sell everything we have. No, we need to follow Jesus. But for this man, his possessions got in the way. This this man truly was in bondage to his possessions. He was chained to earthly treasures which restricted him from following after Jesus. To be in bondage to something means to be attached to it, to be enslaved to it, to be chained to it. If you are in bondage to something, you do not have the authority or will to move about in freedom, but rather you are confined to the limits of what you are in captivity to. Living in America, we will always face the pressure and the temptation to be, bonded, to be in bondage, to be enslaved to our stuff. Because if we live in America, we are a very wealthy group of people compared to the rest of the world. There's actually a website that you can visit called the Global Rich List, where you can input your annual income and it will tell you where you rank compared to the rest of the world. And so I I put in uh, a certain amount just because I was curious. Uh, If you put in $25,000, which is a modest amount in our culture, you are in the top 2% of the richest people in the entire world. And so when Jesus turns to his disciples and say how hard it is for rich people to follow him because of their bondage to their possessions, he certainly could be talking about us in this room. 
in light of what scripture says about money and our belongings, we really need to take a very hard and close look at how we view our possessions and evaluate if we are in bondage to them. Because the consequences could be devastating, more than we even realize. In Acts chapter four, what we looked at last week, we get a glimpse into how this community of believers viewed their possessions. We saw that their belief in Christ led to this great unity among them and their unity changed how they looked at their belongings. In verse 32, we read it. It tells us that their belongings actually ceased to be their belongings because no one considered the things that they possessed to be their own. What we find in this snapshot of their community is the sharing of their possessions as a practical outpouring of their unity. And this makes sense because in my own family, uh, I am more inclined to give as my family uh, needs because we're blood. There's a common bond in the fact that we're Kazarowskis. And so I'm more inclined to give. And in the same way, not only am I more inclined to give as my family needs, but I am also more inclined to uh, be willing to ask my family when I have a need because we're blood. I'm not going to a stranger to ask. I'm actually going to go to my family first because I know that I can go to them for help and support because we are unified by the family name and the family line and the family blood. The local church should function like a family being united in one spirit. Being united, pushing in the same direction, living for the same purpose should motivate us to give freely but to also ask freely in a time of need. Now, I'm not gonna stand here and try and coerce or manipulate you as some famous televangelists do. I won't sit here and say that in order to be a good Christian, you should give freely or you are obligated to meet the needs of others. But what I will say is that the strength of our unity as a church will be demonstrated or evidenced in the culture of our generosity for one another. Acts 4 clearly teaches that a culture of unity develops a culture of generosity. And so you could almost use generosity as a gauge or a meter for, uh, to help determine how unified a group of believers are. The more unified a group of believers are, the more generous they will be. And to this end, I believe that there is a lot for us to be encouraged about here at FAC. I want to brag on our church family for a little bit because I reflect back to a year ago, almost to the day when we launched our 2020 Vision Giving Initiative to pay down our mortgage. We launched this initiative with no lead pastor. Right at the beginning of a transition in leadership and over $600,000 that we owed on the mortgage. People wondered how on earth can we launch this without a lead pastor? We've proven though that our generosity is not based on one person. It's not based on a lead pastor. It's based because we are unified. And just this past week, our balance dipped under $150,000. We, the generosity of the FAC body has not gone unnoticed. And so let's continue as a family to strive for this culture of generosity, not when we're uh, only paying down the mortgage, but meeting each other's needs as well. And we can show the world how unified we truly are. This is what happened in that first community of believers. And what I'd like to do is briefly spend some time looking at verses 34 and 35 Uh, dissect that culture of of, uh, of generosity, uh, what that looked like, and then we'll walk through two examples from this community, one good example and one bad example. Um, First, we see that their generosity is voluntary. 
Some people look at this passage and wrongly believe that this points to some form of Christian communism, if, if you will. They interpret the passage as saying that we as believers should live in a context where everything is shared. It's the obligation of the community to ensure that everyone is on the same level economically. And there have been cult-like communities that have attempted to live in this manner, but this is a huge error in interpretation. No, what is happening here is that the hearts of those who were wealthier in this community were touched and they were driven to meet the needs of others. Uh, It wasn't forced. And so in response, when they were touched, what they would do is they would evaluate what they had. They they would sell a portion of their possessions to, to meet the needs of others. They they took inventory and said, well, I don't really need that field. Uh, or that, that cottage, that vacation home by, down by the sea. Uh, I enjoy it, but I, I don't necessarily need that. And so I'm going to try and meet the need of somebody else. We, we also see a clear implication in this text that these people sold their properties willingly when we wander into chapter five. We'll get to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, but in chapter five, we see that they sell a piece of property, they withhold a portion for themselves, And they don't get in trouble for withholding some back, but they actually get in trouble for claiming that what they had given was all the proceeds. And in the conversation, Peter asks Ananias, why did you lie to us when this property was in your possession to begin with? Almost to say, you didn't have to sell it. You didn't have to sell it. And then he even goes on and said, while it remained unsold, uh, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Ananias, you didn't didn't have to give us all the money. It It was yours. You had the right to voluntarily give as much or as little as you want. And so we see that this is not forced giving. This is voluntary. It's generosity was voluntary. That's the first point I want to make in those first few verses. Secondly, we see that their generosity was submissive. It was submissive. At the beginning of verse 35, we see that while they went on and sold their properties and houses, they actually took the proceeds and laid it at the apostles' feet for distribution. Naturally, in Scripture, when you see this image of putting something at someone's feet or stooping to the level of someone's feet, it's an act of humble submission. And so what we have here are these wealthy, prominent people, high up on the social ladder, taking their wealth that they have ownership of and willingly, humbly giving it over to the apostles and trusting the apostles to distribute it where necessary. We shouldn't miss what they're doing here. It seems odd, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem odd that they wouldn't uh, just give their money directly to the poor? Why do they give their money to the apostles? What these very wealthy people are doing in giving the proceeds to the apostles is relinquishing their ownership of their wealth. They are renouncing their possessions and giving the power of their possessions over to the apostles to discern and to distribute. To lay the proceeds at the apostles' feet is a practical demonstration that they are not enslaved to their money, so much so that someone else gets to decide what is done with it. And through this action, They are very well aware that they are not going to get any kind of return on it because they have just forfeited their ownership of it. Now, I'm not saying that this is a hard and fast rule that we need to stick by, but it does speak to the attitude of the giver. In our context, we must be very careful when we give with strings attached because true generosity is the forfeiture of ownership. From time to time, I get anonymous notes, and I wouldn't encourage it. (laughs) Because anything that's anonymous immediately loses its credibility. But there was one particular anonymous note that I received a couple months back that has just stuck with me over time. And the note said that they were a regular giver to the church, 
and they demanded that we do something a certain way on Sunday mornings. That is not generosity. That is a transaction. That is the attitude that says, I'm going to give and I expect to get something in return. And it's not biblical. The people in Acts, the community, humbly gave over their wealth to the apostles for distribution and trusted that it would be handled in a godly manner. I recognize that when we collect an offering, there is a great deal of trust that you are putting in the leadership of FAC. And I want you to know how seriously we treat stewardship. We find in verse 35, our example, that it was indeed distributed to each as any had need. And that brings me to the final characteristic of their generosity, in that their generosity was continuous. It's continuous. As needs arose, there was money available. It's almost as if the rate of contribution was dependent on the rate of the need. If anyone, uh, if anyone need was filled, eventually another need would pop up and the, the wealthy would determine if they could provide for the new need and it seemed as co- though collectively that they could. This wasn't some kind of one-time giving initiative. This was a continual process that the heart's of many affluent people, they search their own hearts to provide the needs that would continue to arise. This is what the community as a whole looked like. And then Luke brings the camera in closer to give two specific examples from the community. He mentions a good example in Barnabas and he mentions a poor example in Ananias and Sapphira. Now it's important to note um, that in these chapters and these verses, the actual numbers and the headers in the Bible were not there when this was originally written. And so it may be tempting as you read through your Bible and as you read through the headings and as you read through the chapters to separate these two passages. But I believe in the original context that these were made to be compared to each other. Luke actually uses a conjunction. The very first word in chapter five is the conjunction, but... What he's, what he's doing and what he's saying is that Barnabas is meant to be put up and compared to Ananias and Sapphira. Luke, who wrote Acts, wants us to kind of compare and contrast and see the difference between Barnabas and between Ananias and Sapphira. And so you have Barnabas, who pretty much exemplifies what is going on in this uh, ministry, exactly what we've just described. He's a great example of what was happening in this community and that he was sacrificial in his giving, but he was also submissive in his giving as he placed the proceeds at the apostles' feet. Uh, We also have to understand that while Barnabas only sold a field, which may not sound like much, and that culture... The ownership of land was the main source of wealth and the main source of social standing. And so Barnabas isn't just giving away money. It's almost as if he's giving away a piece of his security, giving away a piece of his status, giving away a piece of himself so that someone else may benefit. In a very real sense, Barnabas is denying himself, putting others first, not expecting anything in return as he places the proceeds at the apostles' feet. But then we're introduced to a poor example in Ananias and Sapphira. Just like Barnabas, they also sold a piece of property, but instead of giving it all, they held some back for themselves. However, when they brought the money to the apostles, they tell Peter that this was all the money from the property they had sold. Of course, Peter's having none of that. So he calls out Ananias on the deceit. And then Ananias faces immediate judgment from God. And then Sapphira shows up a few hours later and Peter gives her the opportunity to come clean, to fess up, but she follows in her husband's footsteps. And then she also faces immediate judgment. Now I wanna look at what actually happened and what is going on here. What did they do wrong in this moment? Because once again, as mentioned before, Peter tells Ananias that he didn't have to sell the property. 
And even more so, once the property was sold, Ananias didn't have to give it all. However, I can say with confidence that Ananias and Sapphira's bondage to their possessions, bondage to the praise of man rather than God, actually led to their undoing. It primed them to fall. Paul reminds us in 1 Timothy 6.10 that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Paul's not saying that it's a sin to have wealth. No, he's saying if you love your wealth, if you love your stuff, if we are in bondage to our possessions, this will be the precursor to our sin. This will set us up to do evil things. If I am caught in the snare of materialism. It will hinder me from faithfully walking with Jesus who calls on us to renounce the world and everything in it. I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. Um, A.W. Tozer has this book called The Pursuit of God. In chapter two, it's called The Blessedness of Possessing Nothing. In this chapter, he addresses this issue of the abandonment of our stuff. And I kid you not that this chapter was life-changing for me. In this chapter, Tozer sets the biblical framework for how we should view our possessions. He explains that God created our possessions, our stuff, with the intent that we would use them and enjoy them. However, Tozer explains that these created blessings, our possessions, were always meant to be external and subservient to man, under man. And Tozer writes that in the deep heart of the man was a shrine where none but God was worthy to come. Within him was God and outside was the thousand gifts which God had showered upon him. But when sin entered the world, The very gifts, those gifts of God have now taken the throne room of our heart. And within the human heart, things have taken over. In our sin, creation has been elevated above the creator. The gift has been elevated above the giver. It's it's taken a higher place than the giver and created order has now been distorted because we have substituted God Almighty, who has rightful ownership of our heart, we have substituted him with other things. And now, it is in our fallen nature to possess, to have, and to hoard. Our identity is wrapped up in our stuff. And instead of possessing our stuff, Our stuff possesses us. It has an uncanny hold on us as if we were chained to the very thing that we were meant to enjoy in the context of a perfect communal relationship with God. We were supposed to have freedom to enjoy such things, but now such things are robbing us of our freedom. Now listen to what Tozer says uh, from The Pursuit of God. I absolutely love this. I've got the words up on the screen for you to follow along. He says this, that there is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns, my and mine, look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They are verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things, and we dare not pull up one rootlet lest we die. The only remedy to this disease is to be what Jesus uh, called being poor in spirit, taking on an inward posture in our heart and soul that renounces our stuff. Tozer writes that being poor in spirit essentially means that we reach an inward state paralleling the outward circumstance of the common beggar in the streets of Jerusalem. 
I'm not saying that being poor in spirit means going home and selling all of our things. What I am saying is that while we may have many possessions, we possess nothing. You've pulled the roots of every external thing that has a sinful hold on your heart. You are no longer a slave to the tyranny of things. It's our ability to not be attached. Nothing of this world has a hold on your heart. Its grip has loosened on me. That's being poor in spirit. And so our takeaway this morning, what I want us to understand and learn is not that I should be more generous, but rather I should ask the question, how attached am I to the world? How attached am I to my money? How attached am I to my possessions? Barnabas was poor in spirit. He had many possessions, but counted none of it to himself. He willingly detached himself from his wealth. And we'll actually find as we journey through Acts that this primed Barnabas for a faithful and fruitful walk with Jesus in missions work. However, Ananias and Sapphira were still in the bondage to their stuff. Their heart was still tied to money. And we find, what we find is that having our heart tied to anything of material value leaves us vulnerable. When we are tied to our possessions, our possessions have our heart. And when anything has our heart, other than what it was created for, being God, there is danger. When our heart is possessed by anything other than God, it leaves our heart unguarded. This is why scripture tells us over and over and over again to be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be yielded to him, to be surrendered to him so that he may fully possess us. And if your heart is already possessed by our belongings, then the Holy Spirit can't fully possess us. Whatever your heart is possessed by will influence your actions. To be filled with the Spirit essentially allows him to occupy us and influence us in our walk with Christ. This is what we strive for as believers, to be yielded to God so that he may use us and glorify his name through us. This is what our very denomination started as. The Christian and Missionary Alliance actually just started as a society of people who were devoted to the deeper spirit-filled life. However, if I could draw your attention back to the text, notice what Ananias and Sapphira are filled with. You'll be surprised to see that they aren't being filled by the Spirit. They are not filled with the Spirit, but rather Peter tells Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Why has Satan filled your heart, Ananias? Ananias and Sapphira are in bondage to their possessions. They are tied to their stuff, their heart, which has left their heart vacant and prone to influence from the devil himself. Because of their greed, they are now subject to the influence of Satan. Their view of their own money set the stage laid the groundwork for Satan to come in and infiltrate the ranks. Because they were attached to their money, they made themselves to be puppets of the evil one. This reminds me of another man from Scripture. When Jesus sat down with his disciples for the Passover feast, the day before he would be crucified, we actually read that Satan entered into Judas. And how did that all start? What primed uh, Judas? What prepared his heart to be vacant? When a couple of officials came to Judas and said, hey, Judas, we'll give you 30 pieces of silver if you turn Jesus over to us. 
What this shows us, church, is that our material possessions are way more connected to our spiritual realities than we think. Which is why their crime, Ananias and Sapphira, as Peter puts it, was not against the people physically, but rather against the Holy Spirit. Ananias, you didn't lie to me. You grieved the Holy Spirit. You lied to the Holy Spirit. You came up against the Holy Spirit. You look back at Acts and you'll find that the Holy Spirit is the author of their unity, is the author of their boldness, of their empowerment for mission. And so for Ananias and Sapphira to allow Satan to penetrate their hearts and to allow him to influence in the way that he did is absolutely grievous. No, this isn't just a simple white lie that didn't hurt anyone. This is actually treason to the most high God. They allowed Satan a foothold and carry out his plan against the spirit. The physical act of Ananias and Sapphira combats the very Holy Spirit that fuels this mission of this community. This shows us that our material lives and our spiritual lives are actually linked. How we view our possessions affect our perception of our spiritual lives, so we ought not be chained to the material world. And while Barnabas exemplified this well, we come to find in scripture that there is a greater model for this. Our prime example to the renouncement of the world is not Barnabas, but rather Jesus Christ. Take a look at what Paul writes in Philippians 2. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death." even death on a cross. This tells us that Jesus, who was and is God, emptied himself of such glory and honor that went with being God. He had a right, he had an ownership of glory and honor of all the greatest riches, yet he gave that all up when he became human. He gave up his status, he gave up his security, He gave up himself. He laid it all down and committed himself to death on the cross for the interest of those who are in most need. Sinners like you and me. If I am following Jesus, who gives up everything for the most needy, then who am I to consider anything? Who who am I to consider anything as my own? Who am I to consider my life my own? To sit here and take ardent ownership of anything and call it mine is absolutely contrary and contradictory to the Christian life in Christ. To be tied to anything To be in bondage to my possessions flies in the face of Jesus who paid it all, who gave up everything so that I may be unchained from the world and the oppression of my sin. Let's pray. And Lord, I would ask um, that you would reveal to us uh, the ways that we are still chained to the world. We recognize, Father, that positionally we have been separated from the world, uh, but we are still in the world, Lord, and we know that through uh, this process of becoming more like Jesus that we are also being uh, ripped from the world, and it's painful sometimes, Father. It hurts when you reveal the ugliness of my heart and show me how chained to the world I still am. So I ask, Father, that even in this morning, you would take another link out of that chain. 
I pray, Lord, that our attitude towards our things would be that we possess nothing because your son gave it all for us. Even as we collect the offering now, Father, I pray that this uh, would serve as an act of worship. Lord, it is hard to offer money and it is hard to uh, trust people. And so, Father, I would ask that for those who give, would turn to you and say, Lord, we thank you for our blessings and we do not want to be attached. We want to give joyously and freely. We thank you, Lord, for all that you did give for us and how Jesus did pay it all so that I may gain all in eternity. Would you help us in this life now? And in your holy name I pray, amen.